In an earlier video, we saw that relatively low DHEA sulfate is a weakness in my data. More specifically, we can see that here. So on my last blood test on August 22nd, DHEA sulfate levels were 129 micrograms per deciliter. Now, if I only focused on the reference range, I would miss this as a potential weakness in my data. So why is that? First, DHEA sulfate levels decline during aging. So they increase up until about 20 years of age. Afterwards, they decline uh, up to 80 years old on this plot. Now, when showing my most recent data of 129 micrograms per deciliter, which is three and a half micromolar, we can, see, we can see that I'm low for my chronological age. But potentially more importantly, I have two data points from my early 30s. And when plotting that data, we can see that I was once relatively high, and now I'm relatively lower. And if you look at the two uh, lines, the red line and the black line, it looks like they're somewhat parallel. In other words, it looks like I've experienced an age-related decline for DHEA sulfate, at least based on these three blood tests. So then how is DHEA sulfate related to all-cause mortality risk or ACM risk? And we can see that here, we're looking at cumulative survival or all-cause mortality risk on the y-axis plotted against follow-up. And this was a long study that had a 27-year follow-up, although it only had uh, about 400 subjects, but note that the average age is pretty close to my chronological age. So this data may be directly relevant to me. So in that study, people that had DHEA sulfate levels that were less than 129 had a significantly increased all-cause mortality risk when compared with people who had higher levels of DHEA sulfate. Uh, in this case, it was more than 200 micrograms per deciliter. So from that, we can see that a DHEA sulfate level of 129 micrograms per deciliter puts me at increased all-cause mortality risk. So then how can I raise DHEA sulfate back to youthful and or healthy levels? And note that DHEA sulfate is produced by cholesterol degradation, and we saw that starting with cholesterol, that's converted into pregnenolone, which is hydroxylated into 17-hydroxypregnenolone, which is then converted into DHEA, and then DHEA sulfated to form DHEA sulfate. So to me, it made the most sense to raise blood levels of a cholesterol, and if blood cholesterol, since that's degraded to form DHEA sulfate, I'd expect that my levels of DHEA sulfate would then increase. So note that I've tracked diet in conjunction with blood biomarkers since 2015. And so then I can see which nutrient is most strongly correlated with blood levels of cholesterol in order to affect DHEA, potentially affect DHEA sulfate levels. So in my data, and I know that there are published studies showing that dietary cholesterol doesn't impact blood levels of cholesterol, but in my data, when comparing uh, those two metrics, dietary cholesterol and blood cholesterol, 39 blood tests since 2015, and we can see that there, blood cholesterol on the y-axis plotted against the average daily dietary cholesterol intake on the x. We can see a significant correlation between those two. In other words, when I've had a higher dietary cholesterol intake, blood levels of cholesterol are also correspondingly, corresponding higher. And note that, again, this is a correlation. It's not causation. So from that, that raises the hypothesis. If I increase dietary cholesterol, I should expect to see an increase in blood cholesterol. And then I'd expect to have relatively higher levels of DH DHEA sulfate when compared with my last test. So to test that hypothesis, I used at-home blood testing, and I used the company known as Quantify. And one reason is because their mission is to radically increase human lifespan. And if you're familiar with the, the name of my channel, it's to conquer aging or die trying. So our, our, uh, our, our models align. All right, and if you're interested in measuring your own DHEA sulfate or other biomarkers, I have a discount link for Quantify, and that will be in the video's description. So then I have 16 blood tests. For the first 12 blood tests, dietary cholesterol, my average, uh, my average intake was 22 milligrams per day. And then I added eggs and then measured DHEA sulfate for the next four tests on the next day. So my average di uh, dietary cholesterol, uh, I increased it up to about 212 milligrams per day. And we can see that the p-value when comparing those two groups, uh, there was a significant increase for dietary cholesterol when comparing the 12 tests versus the four tests. All right, so then four at-home DHEA sulfate blood tests the day after egg intake. Let's take a look at that data to see if it worked. And we can see that here. So next morning, DHEA sulfate versus dietary cholesterol as shown there. So for the first 12 tests, with that average dietary cholesterol of 22 milligrams per day, my average DHEA sulfate was about 119 micrograms per deciliter. And then 
after uh, have, including eggs in my diet and measuring DHEA sulfate on the very next day, we can see that my, D, my average DHEA sulfate over those four tests was 105 micrograms per deciliter. Now, besides looking at averages between the two groups, we can compare them statistically with a two sample t-test. And when I did that, these two groups are not significantly different. In fact, one could argue there's a trend towards lower DHEA sulfate with the inclusion of more dietary cholesterol, but note that those two groups of data aren't significantly different. So there was no effect of a higher dietary cholesterol intake on my DHEA sulfate. So, but note that the dietary cholesterol increase didn't raise blood levels of cholesterol. And I know that because Quantify also provided that data on the same day that I also have DHEA sulfate data. So blood levels of total cholesterol for the first 12 tests, when compared with the next four tests, was 106 milligrams per deciliter for both. And the p-value was 0.46. So in other words, Total cholesterol, blood levels of cholesterol, didn't change as a result of having more dietary cholesterol uh, for those four tests. So we can see that there. So in terms of the addressing the hypothesis, I did increase dietary cholesterol, but I didn't. Uh, that didn't affect blood levels of cholesterol, and correspondingly, there was no effect on DHEA sulfate. Now, if total cholesterol impacts DHEA sulfate, in my case, it may be different for others. I'd expect a significant correlation between those two, between total cholesterol and DHEA sulfate. If I'm gonna continue with this hypothesis, should I just increase cholesterol further or just trash it and, and go after something else? So note that total cholesterol is not significantly correlated with DHEA sulfate over those 16 tests. So that would argue against going after increasing blood levels of cholesterol as a strategy to increase DHEA sulfate. So note that there may be a more direct way to increase DHEA sulfate. And then I, I noted, besides supplementation, of course, I can already hear people saying, well, just supplement, fix the problem like that, and problem solved. But that doesn't address why my DHEA sulfate is low, and it doesn't get at the root. And I want to get at the root so that I can potentially um, uh, improve that situation, you know, improve the root cause rather than put a Band-Aid on, on the problem. So note that I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism in my 20s, and since then I've been taking uh, levothyroxine, also known as T4. Uh, so my current dose is 137 and a half micrograms per day. So is there a link between thyroid function with DHEA sulfate? Uh, so there is, DHEA sulfate is decreased in hypothyroidism, and we can see that here. So this is uh, blood levels of DHEA sulfate in people that had an average age of 37 years, and in the hypothyroid cases, people diagnosed as hypothyroid, their average uh, DHEA sulfate was 2.57 micrograms per mil. When compared with relatively healthy controls, which had 3.38, uh, these two groups of data were significantly different. In other words, people that were diagnosed as hypothyroid had significantly lower DHEA sulfate when compared with healthy controls. Now, one study is nice. More studies help to see if this may be a real effect or not. In a second study uh, where they compared hypothyroid patients with healthy controls, and in this case, the age range was closer to my chronological age of about 50, uh, we can again see that the hypothyroid patients had significantly lower levels of DHEA sulfate, red arrow, when compared with the healthy controls, green arrow. Now, note that hypothyroidism doesn't indicate if it's too much TSH or, uh, or if TSH is too high or T4 is low, T3 is low. It doesn't indicate which aspect of being classified as hypothyroid may be related to DHEA sulfate. So relatively higher as a free T3 are significantly correlated with higher levels of DHEA sulfate as one potential uh, factor, one potential mechanism. And we can see that here. So serum levels of DHEA sulfate uh, were significantly correlated with FT3, which is free T3. And we can see the correlation there and the p-value being statistically significant. So in other words, the higher that the levels of free T3, free T3 were in this study, uh, DHEA sulfate was also relatively higher. So that uh, then raises the question, what are my levels of thyroid, ho thyroid hormones, including uh, free T3? What's my data? So for that, I also used home at home blood testing, and this is from a test on uh, October 3rd, so just a couple of weeks ago. Quantify doesn't ha currently have a thyroid panel, so I used a different at home blood testing company. So what, what was, what's, what's my data? So first, starting with thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, and thyroxine, or free T4. Uh, both of those data were within the reference range. Now, note that if you follow my channel uh, and watch a lot of my videos, the reference range is usually not what's optimal for health and longevity. So along those lines, uh, what's optimal for thyroid function, including these three markers of thyroid function, uh, will be in a future video. All right, so what about uh, free T3 as shown there? Well, we can see that my free T3 is low. At, 
especially low relative to the reference range, uh, regardless of in terms of what's optimal. So if I increase my free T3, when considering data on the la last slide, that free T3 was associated with ho relatively higher levels of DHEA sulfate. If I increase that, will DHEA sulfate also increase? So that's my current goal uh, for increasing DHEA sulfate. I'm gonna have to meet with my uh, doctor and probably have to go to the endocrinologist to adjust my thyroid dose. And then we'll have to see how that turns out in terms of DHEA sulfate. Now, interestingly, adjusting my T3 or T4 dose in order to raise my T3 levels may also impact homocysteine, which if, if you're familiar with my data, my most recent value was 12, which is aged, which is uh, higher than what's expected based on my chronological age. So we can see that data here when comparing uh, patients, uh, subclinical hypothyroid patient, patients, SCH is shown there. So this is where they've got elevated TSH, but normal T4. And if you look at that data here on this graph or on this plot, you can see that TSH was indeed higher in the people who had subclinical hypothyroidism, but T4 was not different when compared with healthy controls. Nonetheless, when you look at homocysteine levels in the subclinical hypothyroid group, homocysteine was significantly higher when compared with healthy controls. Uh, now, note that this, this is an observational study, and you know, a, again, correlation doesn't prove causation, but we can more directly address whether thyroid function may be related to homocysteine by looking at randomized controlled trials, RCTs, that included hypothyroid patients that were treated with uh, thyroid hormone. And we can see that data here. So homocysteine is indeed reduced in hypothyroid patients that were treated with levothyroxine, again, also known as T4. So on the y-axis, we're looking at plasma levels of homocysteine, and then we've got two groups, uh, or actually one group, but two different uh, situations. In the first, they were hypothyroid, and in this, this case, they had very poor thyroid function, where their TSH was greater than 25. Uh, so in the previous studies, it was greater than five for subclinical hypothyroidism. This is like full-blown uh, uh, hypothyroidism, where it's, the TSH is dramatically elevated. And then these patients were treated with uh, levothyroxine in order to restore thyroid status, which is known as euthyroid. Uh, and that therapy lasted from three to nine months. So in looking at the data from the left compared with to the right, we can see that homocysteine values were 14.1 when they were hypothyroid. And after restoration of thyroid status, so now, now they're euthyroid, their homocysteine levels significantly declined to 8.2. So there's a 44% reduction for homocysteine upon restoration of thyroid hormone status. So that then raises the question, will adjusting my relatively low levels of free T3 increase DHEA sulfate and or decrease homocysteine? And I don't have that data yet, but stay tuned for that uh, data in a future video. All right, that's all for now. Uh, if you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got some discount links, including at-home blood testing with Quantify, oral microbiome composition with bristle, epigenetic testing with true diagnostic, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee, and all of those discount links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.